All right, guys, so I'm going to do something a little bit different for today's video. This is a video topic that I've wanted to discuss for quite some time now, and I just never really had a good opportunity to do it. But I figured now that spring is here, I just finished up the uh, engine refresh on the 2072 over there, and I'm now doing the same thing to the engine from the 318 here. I figured this would be a good opportunity to discuss something that is often overlooked and uh, to just kind of discuss how underappreciated these old engines are. So this is the Onan P218G engine that came out of this 1987 John Deere 318. It's the original engine to this tractor. And the tractor only has 760 hours on it, um, which is really not a whole lot. That's, you know, most would say that that's not even broken in. And that's true. I mean, um, you know, these older garden tractors and pieces of industrial equipment or agricultural equipment were designed for a very long service life and they were designed to be very dependable years and years ago if you went out to buy a small tractor you went out and bought a small tractor to do tractor tasks around your property not just mow grass um, mowing grass just happens to be one of the many tasks that they could handle um, so in this day and age, you know, you go out and buy a, a small tractor this size, um, you're not getting the same caliber of machine. I think we can all agree on that. Now, there are some nice, you know, consumer level products out there. John Deere puts out a decent heavy garden tractor for the money. Simplicity puts out a decent garden tractor. But the, the concept of a heavy duty small tractor has, uh, you know, really changed over the years. As a result, a lot of people are hanging on to their old machines. They just keep patching them and fixing them up and making them last, you know, as long as they can. And uh, I feel like it may be a good time to discuss how to prolong the life of the engines, specifically the engines, not necessarily the whole tractors. Um, that's, I mean, that, that video will go on for hours. But I want to talk, in this video, I want to focus specifically on the engines. Um, and in particular, Onan engines. So if you follow my channel regularly, you know that I'm a big proponent of the Onan horizontal opposed twin air-cooled gasoline engines that were used in a lot of garden tractors, namely uh, the John Deere 318 that you see here, as well as the John Deere 316, 420, Cup Cadet 982, uh, a whole bunch of Sears and wheel horse garden tractors, as well as Case Ingersoll. Um, the list goes on. Uh, I also want to just make a quick note here that a lot of what I'm going to discuss in this video doesn't just apply to Onan engines, but also applies to other makes of opposed twin engines. So uh, Kohler, you know, like the KT-17, the Magnum 18, or the Briggs & Stratton horizontal opposed twins. A lot of these engines can, you know, live by the same principles. So, you know, these engines are getting to be, or well, these tractors, I should say, these ones in particular are, are all 35 plus years old. Um, they are getting a little antiquated. You know, there's no doubt about that. But uh, in this day and age, you have a lot of people who, you know, they, they want to get the most out of their machine, but they feel like they need to go uh, repower their tractor, uh, replace the original engine with a repower that they can buy because it's, you know, quote unquote, cheaper than rebuilding the old engine in the long run and more efficient. Um, you know, a lot of guys these days will opt to replace their blown up or worn out Kohler or Onan engine with a Briggs & Stratton Vanguard or a Honda GX series V-Twin. Um, which I can understand that mentality, you know, it saves you the headache and the time of having to rebuild the original engine and make sure it's all back to spec as well as sourcing the parts. Um, but contrary to popular belief, owning parts are out there. They are still, you know, made in America, which is rare these days. Um, and they are, for the most part, they are readily available through a Cummins dealer or, uh, you know, if you have to, you can go through John Deere to get most of the parts for these engines. Uh, there's a lot of good aftermarket suppliers such as uh, Boomer's Own and Parts, you got ownandparts.com, you got Gary's Place in Minnesota, um, Jack Small Engines. There are a lot of good resources to get parts for these engines. So a common a common myth with these Own and Engines is that parts are no longer available and you, you, know, or you just can't find them. And that honestly couldn't be further from the truth. I've had a, quite a few of these Onan engines apart. Um, I usually try to buy engines that are in good running condition that don't need a whole lot of work. Um, usually just a, a freshen up as I call it, nothing more. Um, if I buy a bad, you know, or a, a, an engine in poor running condition or just bad, sh bad shape overall, it's mostly just to use for parts. Um, and you know, obviously the, the quality of the engine or the, the reliability you get out of your used engine is going to depend on how it was maintained over the course of its life. Pretty basic concept. If it was given proper maintenance over the course of its 30, 35 year lifespan, um, it'll be reliable. It'll have a lot of life left in it. If it was abused and neglected, you know, that's not going to be the case. 
My point is that a good use running own an engine or Kohler, a post-twin engine, or Briggs & Stratton, a post-twin engine is not as hard to find as you'd think. It's just a matter of knowing what to look for when you go to purchase the machine. At the time of me making this video, today is April 10th, 2022, uh, just a, doing a quick search, a Briggs & Stratton Vanguard replacement engine or repower kit from, say, Small Engine Warehouse will run you like $1,650 for, a, uh, for an 18-horsepower version or $1,800 for the 23-horsepower version. And uh, as of right now, I don't believe the Honda repower kits are available at the moment due to maybe supply shortages um, from THE company who was selling a lot of them. And that one of those engines will run you about $2,200. But uh, I'm not really a fan of either of those options because I've had both of them apart. And I can't say that the internals of those engines were very impressive as you know compared to the Onans. You really have to take the time to tear one of these apart and see just what they're made of before you draw conclusions because I've had them all apart. And... Let me just say, you know, there's a reason these engines are still around, and there's a reason that these were used in so many different applications. You know, there are uh, thousands and thousands of different welders, generators, uh, power units, skid loaders, um, you know, all different kinds of things out there running Onan engines, specifically Onan engines, um, you know, with thousands and thousands of hours on them, you know, reliably. It's not uncommon to hear about a generator or welder that's got, you know, several thousands of hours on it without trouble. Now, in a garden tractor application, that's not always going to be the case because a lot of these were used for mowing grass or doing dirt work, and they're constantly taking in debris. But it can be done. Uh, it can happen with, you know, just a little extra TLC. So that's what I'm going to uh, touch on here. <laughs> If you're even somewhat mechanically inclined, you have an idea of how these engines work and you like to tinker and get your hands dirty, you know, one of these engines can be rebuilt for probably, you know, five or $600 worth of parts if you do everything yourself. And then you figure maybe another $100 or $200 in machine work by the time it's all said and done. You know, that's a lot cheaper than going out and just buying a brand new replacement Briggs & Stratton or Honda engine um, to drop in. Yeah, you're saving yourself a little bit of trouble, but the other thing you have to figure in with that is, you know, half the time with those repower kits, you're also going to have to do some custom wiring. You may have to make a custom mounting plate to bolt the engine in. Uh, you may have to make a custom drive shaft adapter, a uh, custom adapter to fit the PTO clutch. So there's a lot of other variables that people don't consider. Um, and in my opinion, you're really just making more of a headache for yourself if you want to just swap one of those in instead of you know reusing your original engine so well it has been done before and it can be done um is it really worth the added headaches of having to make everything fit just right i also want to mention that for some reason people seem to think that their 318 or 316 or what have you is worth more when they go to sell it if it has a replacement engine in it like a repower engine and uh if you look through any forums any classified pages i mean you can basically see that that's really not true. You know, people think that if they spend fifteen hundred to two grand or more on a replacement engine, that it automatically brings up the value of their tractor if they ever go to sell it. You know, keep in mind I've had five or six of these three eighteens and another three three sixteens and been around many many more. Um, in my mind, if I'm looking at a tractor to purchase and it doesn't have the original engine in it, like it was repowered or replaced, it makes me wonder. Well you know, what was the service life of this tractor like? Did the previous owners abuse it to the point where the original engine quit and then they just decided to take the cheap or easy route and swap an a different engine into it? And it makes you question the integrity of the whole tractor because if the engine failed prematurely or if they put enough hours on it to wear the original engine out, what else on the chassis could be worn as well? Um, it just, you know, it, it brings a lot into question. These older engines were designed for a very long service life, and they were also designed to be rebuilt and reused again, not simply, you know, thrown away and replaced when they wear out like a lot of these newer engines are. Um, you know, I've had a Kohler Command horizontal V-twin apart. I've had a couple of Hondas apart, a couple of Vanguards, and you can very clearly tell the build quality is just not there. You can tell the newer engines really are designed to be thrown away and replaced. And you'll find a lot of shops do the same thing. They, you know, if you take your mower to a shop to have the engine rebuilt, they'll usually opt to just replace the whole thing because it ends up being cheaper in the long run. Um, but like I said, you know, if you're willing to spend a little extra time and source out the parts, this will actually be cheaper in the long run for you. And everything will bolt right up the way it was intended from the factory without much headache. 
So now I'm going to rattle off a list of different items to look for, you know, things to watch out for to prolong the life of one of these engines in your tractors. And like I said, this goes for the 300, 400 series Deers, you know, Cub Cadets, uh, basically any tractor, any older garden tractor, or any old piece of equipment that uses one of these engines. Uh, but this is what I found works best specifically for these Onan engines. So the first thing to take into consideration is the fact that these are an air-cooled engine. They rely on cool air that comes in through the intake, through the flywheel blower, and is directed around the flywheel, across the cylinder heads, through the cooling fins, and then out the front of the engine, or the, the rear of the engine, excuse me. Technically speaking, the flywheel side is the front of the engine, the exhaust or PTO side is the back of the engine, but in most garden tractors, they're actually mounted backwards, so that throws a lot of people off. But the way they're designed is so that um, it let's use the 318 for an example here. So your engine mounts like so in the frame of the tractor with the flywheel facing the rear. That means it has to pull all of its cooling air through these screens here in your dash um, your dash tower. The screens on the side panels, you can see the side panels have the screens there at the rear, as well as through the frame rails. So that means the air coming through every one of those openings needs to be as clean as possible. That is why John Deere uses screens on their dash pedestal pieces. They use screens on their side panels, and they also use a belly screen, which is you know super super important. If I purchase a, if, if I'm looking at a 300 series tractor like a 318 for example, without a belly screen, that is a huge red flag. Because a lot of times, you know, early on in the service life of these machines, the fly, the um, the belly screen gets taken off to get cleaned and then never gets put back on. The belly screen's purpose is specifically to keep large pieces of debris and dust from getting sucked up into that blower housing. Now, a lot of times you buy a tractor that does have a belly screen on it. There's a good chance the belly screen is plugged full of debris and dust. Is that ideal? No, but that does mean that the belly screen is doing its job. The belly screen attaches to the inside, the inner channel of the frame rails with 10 little sheet metal screws that have plastic nut inserts in the frame. Uh, it's, yeah, it's an extra maintenance item to worry about when you're cleaning the machine, but it goes a long way. It really, really does. Um, I see a lot of tractors that are missing these screens or the screens are broken and people just don't care to put them back on. If you had the chance to breathe clean air, wouldn't you take it? I mean, the, the answer is pretty obvious. Um, so that's one thing to look out for. You want to make sure when you purchase one of these tractors, you want to make sure that any, any ventilation, any screens, uh, such as a belly screen, you know, vented side panels, or in the case of an 86 or 87 model year P series engine, uh, the flywheel screen, for some reason, uh, John Deere or Onan, I should say, at least Onan only use this particular screen on the 86 and 87 model year P-Series engines, which were the first two years of production. And then they did away with it, which I really don't understand because, you know, if that screen is attached, you know, that's just one extra barrier for debris to, you know, one extra barrier to catch any debris from getting sucked into that flywheel. So why they did away with it, I'm not 100% sure. But in my opinion, uh, if your engine does not have that blower screen on it, you should add one. You can see the engine in my 782 also has that screen. That's out of an 87 318 as well. And the engine in my 87 2072, which is a B series engine, this is a B48G, also has one of those screens. You know, if it, it's extra protection. That's that's you know, that's all there really is to it. And I don't know, again, like I said, I don't know why Onan did away with that after the first couple years, but I highly recommend you find one of these off of a parts engine and install it. It's a little, you know, extra added insurance. So between the flywheel screen, the vents in the side panels, the vents in your dash pedestal, and the belly screen, um, you know, every one of those is important to filtering out as much debris as possible. Uh, you will see, not on the, the 782 here because the screen from that one is broken, but on the 2072, they also have a, a pretty crude example of a belly screen, but it is still there. On these Cup Cadets, these 82 series, um, a lot of times the belly screen, or what Cup Cadet calls a belly screen, is usually there, but it's cracked or falling off. Um, I highly recommend making sure that that is in place. If you have to make a new one out of mesh, you know, do so. Anything you can do to prevent as much debris from getting sucked into that flywheel as possible. 
along with all of that, you know, even with all those pieces in place, debris will still find its way into the engine. That's why it is so important to keep the cooling fins clean, especially at your cylinder heads right here, because I've said it before, but uh, with these engines, the majority of your heat is being produced right, right in here where the cylinder head attaches to the block. And uh, the aluminum certainly helps to dissipate the heat with these, uh, you know, aluminum blocks, aluminum heads, but the majority of your heat is being produced right there. So um, you got to make sure that those cooling fins are kept as clean as possible. And yes, that does mean that you may have to pull your cylinder shrouds off and occasionally clean them out with a with with you know a vacuum or compressor or whatnot. Um, it's a good you know habit to get into every couple hours or a couple times a season. This one here in the 782, you can see it's a it's pretty dirty at the moment. That's because I'm in the middle of plow day season. I'm not gonna wash it off or clean it off until it's until plowing is done. Uh, but I figured this way we have a good example of a dirty, you know, a typical engine that you'll find um, that hasn't really had much maintenance done to it. And then a cleaner one over there in the 2072. A lot of times you go to look at a tractor with one of these engines, um, the, the, the shrouds and everything are packed full of debris and dirt and you open the hood and this is the first thing you see. Um, so that's usually, at least in my mind, that is a red flag. Also, don't mind the one uh, shroud bolt that's missing here. I have to, I have to retap those threads. The next simplest thing that you can keep in mind, uh, in addition to keeping the you know shrouds and screens and whatnot clean, is to just keep the oil in check in your engine. Uh, now, I'm not here to tell you what brand or what weight of oil to run. Everybody has their own opinion regarding that topic. I've voiced my opinion on that in the past, but it's it's very subjective. Uh, it also depends on you know what, where you live in relation to you know, temperatures and whatnot. So I'm not here to tell you what kind of oil to run, but I am here to tell you that you need, in the case of an air-cooled engine like this especially, you need to keep the oil in check and keep it changed frequently. The Onan service manual recommends changing the oil every 50 hours, or if you work in a dusty environment, change it every 25. So they cut that. They recommend you cut that in half. I usually try and follow the 50-hour interval. John Deere recommends that interval for the 300 and 400 series Onan engines. Uh, Cup Cadet actually recommends 25 hours for the Kohler and the Onan engines. Um, I have I happen to have a copy of the International Harvester Onan Engine Service Manual as well, just for comparison to the John Deere Manual, and they recommend every 25 hours. Um, I don't think any of us are, you know, putting that much wear and tear on our engines in a 25-hour span, unless you do happen to live in a very dusty climate. Um, but like I said, you know, it's it's not going to hurt to cut the oil change interval in half. Uh, you just want to make sure that your oil is kept clean and it's kept at the right level. You don't want to have too much oil because it then starts getting up in your, you know, your breather and in your carburetor and all that. And the extra crankcase pressure can cause seals to blow out. I've had that happen before. Ask me how I know. Like I said, you want to make sure the oil is clean because if the oil gets dirty, then it can start to create premature wear. Um, in the case of this engine here, this B48G in my Super Cub, uh, the cam bearings were wiped out when I got it and the camshaft had actually been walking back and forth just slightly and how the engine still ran as good as it did I don't know but uh, the cam bearings were shot and I determined that it was because somebody that had it before me didn't keep the oil changed as often as they should have and what happened is it basically wore out the thrust washer that the cam gear sits against uh, between it and the block and the cam gear started wearing into that thrust washer and uh, what that did was because the oil was so thin and dirty at that point it actually wore into the machine surface on the block and uh, that's basically what caused the cam bearings to wear out in the long run and it's all because the oil was just a little too dirty or it wasn't changed frequently or a combination of both so it is very important that no matter what oil you're running you keep it in check uh, you know, you keep it at the right level and you keep it clean. And in addition to that, you want to make sure you run a good filter. But uh, this actually goes for both, you know, the oil and the air cooling. You have to make sure that you have one of these in place. Uh, I've, I've discussed these before. Uh, I'll just show you one here since I have one in the package. This is what Onan calls the oil filter gasket. And it's not the gasket that goes behind the filter, but it actually goes between the filter and the shroud. These oil filter shroud gasket pieces here, whatever you want to call them, are extremely important to keeping these engines running cool because what they do is, um, as the basically as the intake air 
is coming through the blower getting directed across the cooling fins you know some of that can get lost out of this little hole here for, for the oil filter and what this seal does is it basically it covers that up it, it does what it can to prevent as much cooling air from being blown out of that hole and lost um, these all of these own engines came with this piece from the factory and then over you know usually what you see is over the course of their lifetime you know somebody will do an oil change they go to pull this off to take the oil filter off they'll change the oil in the filter but they won't replace this they'll just throw it away it's kind of unusual in this day and age to see you know an original engine that still has this piece intact unless somebody knew to really take care of it those often go missing and are overlooked and to be honest with you up until a couple years ago i didn't even know that that piece was a thing um, it's so important to keep that in place that way you're getting as much cooling air directed across that cylinder head as possible you'll see i've got one on this engine here as well and i have that one in the package up there that's going to go on that engine once that's finished so that's another thing to keep in mind it's a five dollar part or five, it used to be five dollars it may be up to ten dollars now with uh with the way inflation has been going but uh it's it's it, my point is it's a very cheap part it's e easy to overlook but it's also very easy to purchase so it's you know not something that should be overlooked while we're on the topic of airflow, I want to discuss another often overlooked point of interest, especially with, um, especially regarding the 300 and 400 series John Deere tractors, and that is the firewall foam insulation. Now, these tractors left the factory with a, a crude, I guess you could say, firewall foam insulation that only covered the top half of the firewall. It came to right about here and then stopped. And as you can probably imagine, uh, that foam isn't meant to last forever. Uh, after 30 or 35 years of use, uh, very rarely do you see one of these tractors that still has its original firewall foam intact. Um, so a lot of people will run these machines, the, the firewall foam disintegrates over time, they don't realize it. Somebody you know, buys the machine secondhand and they, they don't see anything there attached to the firewall. They think that there was nothing there originally. But um, it is very important to have this firewall foam in place. Like I said, the original firewall foam only covered like the top half of the firewall, but you can purchase these replacement firewall foam kits that cover the entire, you know, the entire firewall. Um, these, this particular one here was purchased from a guy on eBay. There's a couple different people selling these aftermarket Mylar foam kits. Uh, one of them, John Lang, uh, used to sell a lot of them on the uh, Weekend Freedom Machines forum. He recently passed away, and uh, there's a seller on eBay now who's manufacturing a similar product. So I highly recommend, uh, you know, in, if you have a 318, 316, 318, 420 or similar, invest in this. Um, the reason that this is so important is uh, basically, I guess the best way I can describe it is that it, when, when the firewall foam is in place and all of the shrouding and everything are in place, you know, the hood, the side panels, screens, the belly screen and everything, basically it turns this whole machine into a vacuum for air. So basically how it works is, well, if you think about it, your engine, when it's mounted in the tractor, that blower is going to be sitting right up against this firewall here, which means there's going to be a tight seal all the way around. That means the engine can only pull its cooling air through, you know, from the center of the tractor. So up from the frame rails, up through the screens here, through the screens and the side panels, all that cooling air is getting directed straight into that flywheel blower housing. And when you have the... Uh, I do, it's, it's designed to work with the hood, the side panels, the grill, and everything in place. You remove one of those pieces from the system, and that flow of air is going to be disrupted. That vacuum is going to be disrupted. It's not going to work the way it's supposed to. People think that they can you know, allow more airflow into their engine if they remove the grill or they remove the side panels, but you're actually disrupting the system. I like to think about it as like a garden hose. If you, if you put your thumb over the end of a garden hose the water pressure is going to increase and it's going to shoot out everywhere. And that's because it's trying to force the same amount of the same volume of water through a tighter space. Therefore, the pressure is going to increase the same basic, you know, crude concept can be applied to this. Um, if you, you know, if with the shrouding and everything in place and that engine tightly packed up against the firewall, um, there's going to be a lot more air pressure or air velocity, I should say, flowing up into that flywheel. Um, you know, if you remove one of those parts from the system, the uh, you know, if you take the hood off, you take the side panels off, you know, that air is going to be directed through other parts of the engine, other parts of the engine compartment, um, and the engine is not going to receive the maximum available amount of airflow, if that makes sense. 
So that's why it's important to have all the side panels, the hood and everything in place. Contrary to popular belief, you're not helping your engine. You're just disrupting that flow of air. Now, in the case of another brand of garden tractor, such as Cup Cadet or, uh, you know, Wheel Horse or whatnot, uh, they're obviously not going to have that foam firewall insulation. Every tractor is laid out a little bit differently. The Cup Cadets, you know, specifically the 82 series here, they do have a firewall, but there's no insulation. But what they do use is a piece of foam, just a basic piece of foam. I know you can't really see it there. Um, there's not a whole lot of light, but it's just a square strip of foam, probably a foot or so long, maybe 14 inches long. And basically that foam pad just wedges in between the flywheel blower and the uh, the firewall. And again, it's supposed to, you know, it, it serves the same function of creating that airtight seal when the engine is mounted in the frame and pressed up against that firewall. It's supposed to keep as much of that cooling air that's getting pulled up through the center of the tractor going into that flywheel blower as possible. It's, it's trying to keep as much of that cooling air in there instead of getting dispersed, you know, elsewhere. So... Like I said, you know, it's a little bit different than what you see on the 318 over there, but it's the same basic concept. Now, granted, the Cup Cadet tractors don't use vents on the side panels. I have the side panels here, as you can see. Um, but they do pull their air from underneath the tractor, as do many different garden tractors that use this style of engine. And the, the concept of the airflow for these tractors applies to even current models that use the V-twin engines. You know, you take like an X700 series deer or, you know, Simplicity with the V-twin engine in it. They all pull their air from the center of the tractor. One last item I'd like to discuss on the topic of uh, air cooling is something that you'll see written in pretty much any operator's manual or owner's manual um, and usually written on a sticker that is placed on the machine somewhere for the operator to see. And that is the concept of running wide open throttle. Uh, and especially in the case of an air cooled engine, when you're putting that thing under a load, whether you're mowing grass, you know, blowing snow or doing anything that requires the engine to lug as it's putting out horsepower and trying to achieve maximum torque and maximum efficiency. You got to run wide open throttle. You got to remember these are air cooled engines. They're only relying on air and oil to keep them cool. And when you put that thing under a load, no matter what job you're doing, that engine's going to build up a lot of heat. Uh, now, in the case of an aluminum block engine like an Onan here, uh, the aluminum does a good job of dissipating that heat. But at the same time, you know, the engine is also relying on cool air being pulled through the fins to displace a lot of that heat. The only way to pull in enough cool air to keep all that heat displaced and keep that constant flow is to run wide open. Think about it this way. I'm going to try and dumb down a thermodynamics course here for those of you um, who may not be familiar with this concept. Uh, so if you run, say, you know, anything less than wide open throttle, let's say you're mowing grass at half throttle or three quarters throttle. Sure, your engine's not, you know, it's not uh, running quite as high of an RPM. You think it wouldn't be building up quite as much heat and it wouldn't be using quite as much fuel. That may or may not be true. Um, however, the engine is also not pulling in the right amount of cooling air to displace all of the heat that it is producing. So while it's not running as fast as it could be, the engine is still basically going to overheat. You know, whether you, if you let it sit there and idle too long, it's going to build up a lot of heat. It's not going to be pulling in enough cold air to displace all that heat. So all that's doing is putting more wear and tear on the engine itself. Um, in the case of an Onan especially, these P-series are notorious for wiping out the valve seats because they use a thin steel valve seat pressed into an aluminum block. And people, you know, over, over the years, they don't take the time to clean out the cooling fins and they don't run them wide open when they're lugging them, you know, putting them to work. And while that heat builds up over time and it causes the block to warp slightly, which can be just enough movement to knock the valve seats loose. Um, you see that on a lot of these P-series engines. Um, and not just an Onan engine. I mean, it can happen on any engine pretty much. A lot of, the, a lot of them are subject to overheating. You got to remember, the, these engines need as much airflow as possible in addition to good oil, but mainly airflow. Um, so as your RPM decreases, the amount of cooling air it's pulling in also decreases, which in turn allows the engine to build more heat and there's not going to be enough cooling air to displace all that heat. So what I'm trying to say is your engine is going to work most efficiently at wide open throttle because while it's generating a lot of heat at a high speed like that, it's also pulling in more than enough cold air to displace all that heat. So it keeps that, that flow steady. It's a very highly debated topic, I understand that, but uh, you know, I used to buy into the myth that 
running less than wide open throttle is easier on the engine. Trust me, you know, you, you go back and look at any of my YouTube videos from eight, 10 years ago, you'll see me running one of my old tractors mowing it like half throttle or three quarters throttle because I thought it was best for the engine. Well, I certainly regret that. I, I don't advise anybody to do that because in the long run, it only puts more wear and tear on your engine and your machine. I'm not just saying that. It's from experience because I've had a few of these apart and I've seen what that, you know, excessive heat can do. Um, case in point, over the winter when I had the engine out of my 2072 here, uh, once I took the time to decarbon the heads and valves and whatnot, I could see some discoloration on the valve surfaces, which tells me that the engine overheated at some point and got a little too hot. And that is most likely because somebody was not running wide open throttle or did not keep the cooling fins in the engine clean. It allowed that aluminum, the aluminum block to warp a little bit. Um, it allows, you know, excess heat on the valves and uh, you can burn out valves that way. You can do a lot of damage, a lot more damage than you think. So that is why it is so important to run wide open throttle with these. I can't stress that enough. Like I said, I used to buy into the myth that wide open throttle was excessive, but after you spend thousands of hours mowing grass and, you know, putting these engines to work, you learn otherwise. A couple minutes ago, I mentioned decarboning the cylinder heads. That is another very important and often overlooked maintenance item regarding not just these particular engines, but pretty much any small engine. Um, this also could apply to the engine in your car or truck as well. Uh, these are my two own and parts engines here. This one is a B43E. This one is a B48G. I don't know how many hours are on either of these engines. I just have them torn down uh, for parts, nothing else. They could be rebuilt if I wanted, but I don't have any plans to do that right now. Um, in an engine like this, especially an opposed twin that will typically you know, suck a little bit of oil past the valve guides and into the cylinders just by nature. It doesn't take a whole lot of runtime to develop that kind of carbon buildup on the cylinder heads. You know, that is a result of oil getting past the piston rings, getting up into the combustion chamber, and then getting burnt. If your engine blows a little bit of blue smoke, that's an indicator that it's burning oil. And after so many hours of doing that, you'll get this carbon buildup. This is not the worst that I've seen, but it's also not ideal. I bet if you pull it, you know, if you have one of these engines right now that you're currently using, the, the cylinders will look like that if you were to pull the heads off. Um, like I said, it doesn't take a whole lot of runtime to develop that kind of carbon buildup. And uh, over so many hours of runtime, all that carbon buildup is going to generate more and more heat. That accelerate that, that amount of heat can accelerate, you know, the valve seats getting tossed, especially on the, the P series engines. They're notorious for that, like I mentioned before. Um, it makes your engine run hotter less efficient and it just creates more wear and tear in the long run that is why Onan and John Deere both recommend decarboning your cylinder heads every 500 hours as per the manual it's a good habit to get into not just on an Onan engine but any small air-cooled engine or honestly any engine really of any size it's very important that you take the time to you know pull your cylinder heads off inspect your cylinder walls for wear you can inspect the top of the piston inspect the valves the valve seats the valve guides while you have all that apart. Um, it's also not a bad idea to take, you know, a, a fine piece of steel wool or a scotch bright pad and some carburetor cleaner or some stove cleaner. Uh, you know, just kind of go at it, scrub away all the carbon buildup, make sure all those surfaces are clean, make sure the valves are seating properly. Uh, if it comes down to it, you can always lap the valves. I usually don't do that on an engine that has lower hours because that's typically not something you should have to worry about until they get a couple thousand hours on them assuming the engine's been care, you know, properly cared for. Um, but it's never a bad idea to go in and clean your intake and exhaust ports, especially these surfaces here where the intake and exhaust gaskets and the manifolds all meet up. You want to make sure those have a good tight seal. Um, you want to clean out as much of that carbon as you can. That will reduce the amount of heat buildup. When I pull the heads off, I usually have them machined at a local shop. We have a shop here that will machine them down smooth to you know take out any warping. And we'll also bead blast them so that those fins on the cylinder heads are clean. Um, you know, it's it's good insurance helps the engine. You know, any any little bit you can do to keep that engine running cool helps. And while I do, while I have it apart, I will always replace the cylinder head bolts because, like I said in previous videos, those the original cylinder head bolts will have stretched after so many thousands of hours and so many heat cycles in that aluminum. So it's a good idea to replace the bolts with new grade eight bolts and to torque them to spec. Uh, when you have these apart, you run them, you put the engine back together, you run them for a little bit, let it go through a heat cycle, let it cool down, and then you retorque the cylinder heads again. That way you know you're getting a proper seal. But that 
you know, in conjunction with new head gaskets and having the heads decarboned is another very important step you can take to make sure these engines run cool and last a long time. I just want to spend the last few minutes here discussing a few improvements that I believe should be made to every one of these engines, uh, mainly just improving some factory flaws, some things that these were notorious for that could be easily fixed. Um, the first one, as I mentioned before, uh, especially with the P-Series engines like the one you see here, are the valve seats. Uh, the P-Series, like I said, were known for tossing the valve seats when they overheated. The fix for that is to have the block machine to accept a larger oversized valve seat. A lot of guys like to use the hardened valve seats from a B-Series. They press those in and they don't have any more issues. Um, that is one way to fix that problem. And uh, something that, in my opinion, should not be overlooked, especially if you're going through the engine and rebuilding it. The next issue is one that uh, I've touched on before in many, many, many of my previous videos, but I'll go over it again. I've had three or four of these engines apart for flyball spacer problems. And basically, the flyball spacer is a spider gear that is glued to the end of the cam gear. And the flyball spacer houses a bunch of ball bearings or flyballs. And uh, what happens over time is, uh, especially with these P-Series engines and the very late B-Series engines starting in late 85, that's when they made the switch um, from the steel to the plastic flyball spacer. With the plastic flyball spacer, as the engine builds up heat, the plastic starts to warp and the flyball spacer gear actually works its way loose from the cam gear. And then the flyball spacer will rotate on its own and will basically try to open the governor up by itself, you know, independent of your controlling it. So... How that is represented in a running engine is, uh, let's say you have a 318 and you're mowing tall grass. You're doing something that is putting the engine under load. The engine's lugging. You come out of the tall grass. The engine tries, you know, the governor kicks in, tries to pick the engine back up to speed again. What will happen is the flyball spacer will try and basically take off and the governor will overcompensate and the engine will actually over rev a little bit until it gets back down to regular speed. Um, it's very common to see that on the 86 model year and up, you know, 316, 318, 420 tractors. And uh, I've even seen some Cub Cadet 982s do it uh, with the, the late B-series engines that had that plastic flyball spacer as well. Um, it's a, you know, it, it's kind of a pain to do the fix, but uh, it's well worth it because, you know, you're saving a lot of wear and tear on your engine in the long run. Um, so the fix is to replace the plastic flyball spacer with a steel one from an older Onan engine, such as an earlier B series or a, a CCK series or an N series. Usually, or at least up until a couple years ago, your best bet was to find a parts Onan engine like the two that I have in my other room there. Um, a parts engine with the steel flyball spacer already in place. And then you can take the, the flyball spacer off of that. Uh, usually they come off if you if you heat them up a little bit, and then you can walk them off with your fingers. Um, you swap the plastic flyball spacer out for the steel one, and you can steel you can weld either tack weld or Loctite the steel flyball spacer onto the cam gear. And uh, in theory, that is supposed to prevent the gear from slipping in the future, and then your governor will work properly. Very common issue with these engines, like I said before. Um, Sometimes the plastic flyball spacers even break. I've seen that happen before, and then your governor won't work at all. It's definitely uh, not something to just not pay attention to. It's not necessarily an easy job to do. Uh, or I shouldn't say that it's not easy. It's just very time-consuming because you have to pull the shroud off. You have to pull off the flywheel and the timing cover. Um, that's actually the main reason I pulled this engine out of the 318 here because this is an 86 model year P218 engine, the first year that they made them, so it had the plastic flyball spacer, and it was due anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, if your engine was made after 85, there's a good chance it has a plastic flyball spacer, and it wasn't until like 1988 or 89 that they updated the cam gear design to have an extra notch in it. And with that, they also updated the plastic flyball spacer to have an extended tab to fit within that notch to keep it from spinning. Uh, that works to prevent it from over revving. Um, you don't see the over rev issue as much on those later models that have the extended tooth flyball spacer, but it is still a plastic gear, so the 
the chances of it breaking are still there. Um, so I just, to be on the safe side, I like to replace them with a steel one. There's also a couple of aftermarket suppliers that are manufacturing aluminum ones now. I can't remember any of them offhand. I haven't really dealt with the aluminum ones, just the steel. Um, but they are out there. So like I said, your best bet would be to you know, find a parts engine, like an older own an engine, or um, you can go through some of those aftermarket suppliers to get that part. It is kind of an obscure part because Onan will try and sell you a whole cam gear when you really just need the spider gear that goes on it. But uh, that is a worthwhile upgrade to do to any P-Series engine. Another worthwhile upgrade that should be done to any P-Series engine, in my opinion, is the B-Series oil pan and starter swap. A uh, very common issue with the P-Series Onan engines was that they would break starter mounts and uh, that was due to a casting flaw, essentially, or just a piss-poor design from the factory, in my opinion. On the P-Series Onan engines, the starter attaches to the underside of the, the left-hand cylinder head, the number one cylinder head. Uh, it's basically just a very uh, two very long sleeves cast into the bottom of the head, and then the starter hangs off of that with two long bolts. And what happens over time uh, is usually while cranking, if the engine were to backfire or skip at all, um, it would put excess torque on the starter gear and would push back on the starter and would cause the mounts to crack. And over time, those cracks spread to the point where the starter will not sit in alignment, you know, proper alignment. And then the starter teeth will just grind or the starter won't engage at all. And it's very common to see that on the P-Series engines. Uh, that was the case with this 318. When I first bought it, the starter would occasionally grind and miss. It just didn't sound right. And eventually it got to the point where the starter was, the, the cracks had gotten so bad that the starter wouldn't even engage anymore. It would just grind. So I had no choice but to pull it out. And uh, there's a couple different things you can do to fix that problem. Some of the more ambitious guys out there have aluminum welded the uh, starter mounting bosses back on the bottom of the block again. But in my opinion, it's just a crappy design from the factory. So what I like to do is upgrade the oil pan and starter. And the reason you have to upgrade the oil pan as well is because the B-series engines attach the starter to the oil pan itself instead of the underside of the block. Um, it just attaches, the starter attaches to the front of the oil pan with two bolts that are torqued to 25 foot-pounds each. And in my opinion, it makes serviceability much easier. You can pull the whole oil pan off um, and pull the starter off as one, as one assembly. Uh, you don't have to take the, the shroud or anything like that off. And... Uh, the, it just seems like a much better design that way overall instead of hanging the starter off the bottom of the block. I don't know whose idea that was. Um, now, you'll notice this has the solenoid shift starter. That is off of an 86 model year, 318. Uh, 86 was the only year of the B-series engine that had the solenoid shift starter as opposed to the older inertia starter that had a separate solenoid. I opted for this style of starter just so I didn't have to change my wiring um, and also because... Being an 87, it has the hole cut in the frame to fit that solenoid with the, uh, to fit the starter with the solenoid attached. Um, like I said, I didn't want to have to hack up any of my wiring to make the older style starter work. Um, that's just a personal preference. So you have a couple different options there as far as starters go, but you have to make sure that the starter you use is the correct one for a B series, not a P series. It's easy to confuse these two, but the, the main difference is the orientation of the mounting holes. Um, so I swapped out a, an 86 B43G starter and oil pan, and uh, with that you also get the, with the B-series oil pan, you also have the dipstick tube that is pressed in. It doesn't just sit inside of a rubber seal like it does on the P-series. So um, on those, that's another thing to leak on the P-series engines, but without that rubber seal there, those usually stay pretty tight. So that's another advantage of doing that swap. As with any engine, there will be seals that will need to be changed, especially considering, once again, that these engines are 30 years old at the absolute youngest. Um, the Onan engines in particular have a seal behind the oil filter adapter plate where the oil filter housing bolts onto the block. Um, it's actually a gasket. Those gaskets are prone to leakage, and then the leak will drip onto the flywheel. The flywheel will sling oil all throughout and then it will just build up debris and make a mess causing the engine to overheat. Those are very overlooked. I've pulled the flywheel covers off of several engines and found what looks like a rat's nest inside but is actually the result of oil and sludge buildup, uh, collecting a lot of grass and dust. 
and uh, that will cause the engine to overheat in a heartbeat. So that is something not to overlook. If you're going to go to the trouble to pull your engine out, you take the flywheel housing off, you want to make sure that that is clean because that's where your engine is pulling all of its cold, you know, cooling air through. Uh, the front main seal is inside the timing cover, which is behind the flywheel. Um, that must be changed when you take the timing cover off to do like a fly ball spacer job, for instance. Uh, that comes out pretty easily with the proper size seal driver. When the front main seal develops a leak, uh, similar to the oil filter adapter gasket, um, that will also drip oil onto the flywheel, which will then fling it around everywhere and make a mess. There is a tiny seal in the top of the timing cover where the governor shaft sits down in. Um, those aren't usually prone to leakage, but if you're going to go to the trouble to take the engine apart and take the timing cover off, uh, you might as well just take an extra minute or two to pull the governor shaft out and replace that seal. It pops right out and you can pop a new one in. Additionally, you have the rear main seal, which uh, relative to the tractor would actually be the front main seal or what some people call the PTO seal on the crankshaft that sits behind the PTO clutch within the main bearing plate uh, or main bearing housing as some people call it. Um, once you get the PTO off the bearing housing comes off with just a couple of bolts and then the seal presses into that. Um, once again that's a very easy seal to change if you have the right size seal driver. Um, those will tend to leak. They get oil all over the PTO clutch in the front of the engine and then that will build up debris over time. My point is, uh, regardless of how you know how many hours your engine has on it, just given the age and the nature of these engines, there's a good chance those seals, uh, if they haven't already started to leak, they will leak very soon. Once they start leaking oil, that engine is just going to attract as much debris as possible, and uh, there will be a lot of buildup, which will reduce the amount of cooling air that that engine can handle. So it is imperative that you take the time to pull the engine out, and if you're going to go to the trouble to clean it, you might as well replace all those seals while you're at it. Do it once and do it right. Last but not least, you also want to pay attention to your intake manifold and carburetor on these engines. As you can see, the intake manifold on the Onan engines is a two-piece design. It's actually an upper and a lower half that are riveted together and sealed with a Permatex-like material from the factory. And what happens over time is the seal between the upper and lower halves will actually disintegrate and rupture and then it will develop vacuum leaks and when those leaks develop the engine will actually start surging or galloping as some people call it uh, and it often gives off the impression of a dirty carburetor a lot of people mistake that for a dirty carburetor but in my experience probably 75 to 80 percent of the time if your engine is surging it is actually due to an intake manifold leak um, of course it never hurts to clean your carburetor but more often than not uh, a lot of times people will have a surging issue they clean their carburetor and then it still surges and they wonder you know they, they wonder what else it could be a lot of times it ends up being a leaking intake manifold so uh, the fix for that is to you know once you've got the carbon intake manifold off which unfortunately is not exactly easy because you have to pop the uh, exhaust manifolds off um, not my most favorite thing about these engines. It's a pretty poor design if you ask me. But anyway, um, the fix for the leak is to pull the intake manifold off the engine, drill out the rivets that hold the two halves together, and then once you split the two halves apart, clean up the mating surfaces so they're good and clean. Um, add Permatex Moto Seal, which is a gas-resistant sealant um, between them. Sandwich the two halves back together and replace the rivets with quarter inch machine screws and nuts. I don't recommend using rivets. I just recommend using the machine screws. I think it's a little easier that way. And then don't tighten the machine screws down. What you want to do is reinstall the manifold on the engine like you normally would. Torque the mounting bolts to spec. And then once the mounting bolts are torqued to spec and you've got the new, you know, with the new gaskets installed, obviously, um, then you go back and tighten all the machine screws down because what can happen is if the bolts, if the mounting bolts aren't torqued to spec, the intake manifold can actually sit kind of lopsided and it will rock back and forth if the two halves aren't put together just right. Um, so a lot of people overlook that step, but you, you want to install the, the resealed manifold first and then tighten all the machine screws down and then let it sit for 24 hours. Uh, that is usually the best way to fix that intake manifold leak. Um, it's very common. You know, you see it all the time. And uh, when you, every time you pull the intake manifold off, you also want to make sure you replace the intake gaskets because you want as good of a seal as possible. Uh, it's just a, you know, it's a simple and often overlooked step. Um, it's good insurance against a future leak. So that's definitely something you want to pay attention to as well. 
So these are just a few of the key points that need to be considered when you're taking care of one of these old horizontal opposed twin engines. Uh, this video is geared specifically toward the own and B&P series that were commonly found in some of the most popular garden tractors made like the John Deere 318 and the Cup Cadet 982 and similar. Um, but a lot of the things I've discussed also apply to other makes and models of opposed twin engines and even some of the newer air-cooled V-twin engines as well. Uh, they're all good. They should all be taken into account if you want to really get the most life out of your engine and really push it to that three or 4,000 hour interval. Um, a lot of people don't give these engines credit, but they are fully capable of making it to that point. It's just, uh, it's unfortunate that so many of them over their lifespan didn't get to see that kind of maintenance that they needed to get to that point. And especially in a tractor application, it's very demanding for those engines. Uh, they're constantly subject to heat, debris, and whatnot. And they're in a kind of crammed into a tight spot there. So they're trying to, you know, they're only restricted to having so much airflow. So it's unfortunate that a lot of them didn't make it as far as they were designed to. But uh, with a little bit of care and TLC, you know, there's no reason those engines can't last forever. And I truly do believe that those are built to you know, run forever. They were designed to be rebuilt and used over and over again instead of just being thrown away and replaced when they wore out. Um, and at the end of the day, you really can't beat the sound of a good running opposed to one. I think they sound awesome. Just watch any of my YouTube videos on the 318 or the 782 and you'll see what I mean. So hopefully this helps some of you guys out who have a 318, a 420, or even, you know, like a 782 or 982 or 2072 or something of that vintage. Um, this also applies to the wheel horse guys, the Sears guys, and anybody who is interested in preserving history. Um, so hopefully this is able to help some of you guys out and hopefully we can uh, do our part in keeping a lot of these older engines running for years and years to come. So the fewer repowers we see out there, the better, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, I would like to do a follow-up video to this one at some point in the future, probably not anytime soon, where I tear down an Onan and I also tear down a Honda and a Briggs V-twin engine just to compare the internals just so you guys can see the difference in their construction. And uh, hopefully that gives you guys something good to go off of and uh, hopefully that helps ease your decision whether to repower your 318 or to rebuild the original engine. I know which way I would go. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching guys. I appreciate the, the comments and the likes and whatnot. And if you have any questions or concerns or want to debate anything, uh, feel free to leave a comment and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks for watching, guys. Catch you next time.